Come on, gospel family. Hey, can we just take a moment and express some gratitude for God bringing us to a place like this today? Come on, if you're thankful just to be here this morning, you could have been anywhere else. That is the truth. You could have been anywhere else. You could have been at home. The Lord knows you probably got in a fight with your pillow, but you won and you're here. The Lord's love was so good that it pulled you out and brought to you to Gospel Church. Hey, as your pastor said, my name is Andrew. I have the honor and privilege of sharing the message with you today and continuing your series, Spiritual Family. But really quick, why don't you go ahead and have a seat right where you're at. Relax. You know you can relax in God's house, right? Tell your neighbor, say, relax. Relax. <laughs> oh, man. Um, for those of you who may not know, um, I'm actually part of the gospel family. And the way I play my part as, uh, as here at gospel is uh, as a board member. And basically what I get to do is I get to just be that extra oversight and accountability for your guys as pastors, Pastor Billy and Pastor Randy. And basically uh, having a board, when, a, when a pastors have a board, it's just extra accountability. And aren't you thankful that you have leaders and pastors who invite accountability, who say, hey, I, we want you to see what we're doing. We wanna see what God is doing. And hey, if there's something maybe out of alignment, hey, let us know. And the beautiful thing about leaders with accountability is that leaders with accountability always walk with a healthy level of humility. It takes a humble leader to say, hey, we want you to oversee what we do versus I'm just gonna do what I wanna do. And so again, I am a part of the Gospel family. I'm so grateful to be here all the way from, from Southern Cali, let's go. From Southern Cali, and I came out here to Fredonia, let's go, Western New York, amen. So excited for what God is gonna continue to do. Uh, speaking of family, really quick, um, you know, I, I wish my family could be with me, wish my wife could have rolled with me and my kids, maybe next time. But I wanna introduce you to the family that I'm a part of because I'm not just a pastor. Again, as your pastor said, I'm also a husband and a father. This is my amazing family right there. Somebody say, aw. The beautiful woman to your left there is my helpmate. Uh, she's the one who helps me behave. Uh, husbands in the house, aren't you thankful for your helpmates? You know, I don't know where I would be. I don't know what kind of decisions I would make if I didn't have my helpmate, my amazing wife, Ashley, my oldest son there in the middle, who's so excited about this photo that we're taking, as you could tell. Um, that is Luke, he's 18. I love him so much. And then I got my two little ones. I got uh, Josiah, again, to your left there in front of my wife, who's uh, six years old. And then I got Landon, who's two, going on three. And I wanna point something out. Don't let this photo fool you. There was a battle that took place prior to this moment right here. It was like herding cattle. Matter of fact, I think I find myself more as a referee than a father when it comes to my kids because they're always going at it. And I had to do some refereeing just to, just to make this happen so that I could present my family to you all and you could see my amazing family. So I'm so thankful. One thing that you know I continue to pray for is that God would help me um, dispense my passion evenly across all my ministries. Because being a husband is also my ministry. Being a father is also my ministry, as well as being a pastor at God's house, specifically where I come from, uh, Destiny Church. And really quick, hey, just wanna give a shout out to anybody that's tuning in online. Come on, let's give it up for all those that are joining us from all over the world. I know I got some friends and family showing some support, showing some love that are there. Hey, let us know if you're, if you're there, maybe for the first time, you know, let us know in the chat there, but so glad that you found this, so glad that everybody's here, including those tuning in online. We truly believe that you're not an accident, that you're here by you being here, it's a result of God's love. We believe that God's love was so good and still continues to be good that it led you to a place called Gospel Church not only for those that are here in person, but for everybody tuning in online. But I'm so fired up for the word that God has put inside of me. And so, hey, without further ado, you guys ready to get into today's word this morning? Come on, if you can, stand with me and open up your Bibles to the book of Romans, the reason we stand. And I'd like to encourage everybody to stand in the opening of the word. That is because we honor the authority when it comes to God's word. 
And so part of us standing in this moment as we're opening up God's word, God's truth, it's our moment of just saying we honor this right here. We truly believe that the word of God can bring dead things to life. Uh, the word of God can lead us through any situation. Uh, the word of God, as the Bible says, is sharper than a double-edged sword, that it can pierce through anything that may be trying to get in the way of you receiving what God has for you. So Romans chapter eight, verses 15 through 16, I'm reading the Passion Translation. And again, we're continuing in a series, uh, a spiritual family here at Gospel. The Bible reads like this, it says, and you did not receive the spirit of religious duty leading you back into the fear of never being good enough. But you have received the spirit of full acceptance. Somebody say, I'm accepted. Come on, say it like you believe it. Say, I'm accepted. It says you received the spirit of full acceptance enfolding you into the family of God and you will never feel orphaned. I'm gonna say that one more time. And you will never feel orphaned. For as he rises up within us, our spirits join him in saying the words of tender affection, beloved Father. For the Holy Spirit makes God's fatherhood real to us. I love that. The Holy Spirit makes God's fatherhood real to us as he whispers into our innermost being, you are God's beloved child. You are God's beloved child. It's amazing what happens when you receive Jesus and accept God as a father. And what happens when you join the family of faith? I have a message today that I've just simply entitled, The Family I Need. The Family I Need. Let's pray. Father, thank you so much just for everything you've already done up to this point. Father, I'm reminded of what your word says. Your word says that where the spirit of the Lord is, there is freedom. We don't need to wait for the word to experience freedom. We just need your spirit. Your spirit's already here. And I thank you, Father God, that you've already prepared every heart and every mind to be able to receive your word this morning, Father. And I thank you that your word does what we know it does best. And that is that it builds our faith, Father. That it lifts us up, Father. That it inspires us supernaturally, Father. That it helps us to see the other side of the mountain and it helps us see how valuable it is to be part of a spiritual family, of this gospel family. In Jesus' name, everybody that believed that said, amen, amen. Hey, really quick, before you see that, high five three people and just tell them, we family, we family. Come on, let them know, we're family. We're family in this house. Amen. Hallelujah, so good. We're family in this house. You know, when, uh, when I was growing up, and maybe you could relate to this, but when I was growing up, um, I, used to, I used to like watching, you know, some good family shows. Anybody have a good family show that you would go to when you were growing up, you know, that you would like to watch with your family? Um, I know I had one. There was a few, but one in particular, there was a family show that I used to watch. Um, of course, the family dynamic was different, and I believe some people could actually relate to it. But there was one family show that I would watch with my grandfather every Friday. Every Friday, I would meet up with my grandpa. I'd have coffee with him. I was very close to my grandpa. My grandpa was almost like a father figure to me growing up. And we would watch Sanford and Son. Come on. And I remember what's his name would say, Elizabeth, I'm coming early. <laughs> and me and my grandfather would just sit there. We'd laugh and we enjoy good times. You know, for some of you, maybe if you're unfamiliar with Sanford and Son, uh, maybe for some of you, your family show was The Brady Bunch. You know, and used to watch what happened. It was a blended family. Maybe you could relate to that. Maybe you're a part of a blended family physically. Hey, just to let you know, church is actually one big blended family. Yeah. Right? People from all different backgrounds and cultures, but all headed towards the same destination. This place called heaven in Jesus' name, right? Yeah. Um, so yeah, maybe it was that show for you. Or maybe, you know, for some of us, maybe it was, maybe it was uh, the Jeffersons. There was a show called The Jeffersons that a lot of people would watch. Amazing. And again, maybe you related some of those family elements. And then lastly, man, I used to also like to watch this one called Home Improvement yeah. with Tim Allen. The one used to go, he used to go, oh, oh, oh. You remember that? I used to love that show. One thing that I realized, though, out of all those family shows that I think a lot of us have seen maybe growing up, one thing that I've realized is it wasn't so much the humor that drew me to the show or that drew me to the show. 
I've realized that what really drew me to a lot of these shows is I can actually relate to the family challenges that you would witness. Because if you haven't figured it out by now, every family comes with challenges. Uh, there is no perfect family. Uh, that's why there's also no perfect church. But one thing I could say about gospel, especially coming from a board member perspective and overseeing the fruit of gospel church, and this is, this is a fruitful house. This is a fruitful house where God is moving. And I know that because the last time I spoke here, I spoke at a theater. But the setting changed. You know how you know when God is doing a thing is when he changes the scenery. Uh, uh, you, know, you know you're walking by faith when you're seeing things differently. And so you know that your pastors, Pastor Billy and Pastor, you know they're led by God because you're not in the same place that you used to be. Gospel's not uh, bound to a theater anymore. Here you are in your own building. And it's just amazing what God has done. But it's no perfect family. Look at your neighbor and say, we're not perfect. We're not perfect. But this is a healthy place. And so all... All of these different shows, again, I think we could relate to a lot of the challenges. And, you know, one thing that I found myself relating to, um, one thing that I found myself relating to when it came to these family challenges is I had family challenges myself. Matter of fact, uh, one thing that's, um, that created some challenges in my upbringing, and I'm going to talk about some of these challenges that I think you could relate to, maybe even in your physical family. But see, I wasn't raised in church. Matter of fact, if uh, 15 years ago, if somebody were to tell me that they saw me going from Southern California to Western New York to share the word of God with this church called gospel, I would have told that person, I would have responded to that person and said, whatever drugs you are doing, I'll go ahead and take some right now and we can enjoy this together because I never seen it. But it's amazing what God can do and how he can leave you in awe when you allow him to move in your life. It's amazing where God leads you to. But again, challenges are inevitable. Challenges come in all shapes and sizes. But here's some, here's some family dynamics that I believe some of us can relate to. And as I read through these, I want to let you know that God's love is so good that he can lead you through these challenges. Uh, the reason I want to read through these is just to make you aware of where the enemy tries to come in in a family. And how he tries to make things more difficult for you and your family. Here's some of the fi fi uh, family dynamics that kind of create some difficulty. You know, some difficulties in family are abuse, sad to say. And this could be verbal or physical. And maybe that's caused some tension or frustration or even some division within family. Uh, maybe absent parent. Absent parent is another factor that sometimes creates some challenges within family. I know what that's like. Matter of fact, a, a little bit more about me and just what God has, has brought me out of and how he's brought me to where I'm at today. Um, my dad made a decision when I was about nine years old and the decision that he made to commit a crime, it led him to 15 plus years in prison. Uh, my dad ended up doing 26 years. 26 years. And I share that because that happened in my life when I was nine years old. And here I was a young boy at nine years old, learning what it's like to grow up and become a man. Uh, I was left to make a lot of decisions by myself. I was left to, uh, I was left to kind of wander and figure things out. Anybody have a season like that in your life before yeah. where you just had to figure it out because maybe you didn't have a healthy leader in your life, whether it was a parent or whomever it was. But again, these are fam family dynamics that create some, some difficulties. It could be an absent parent. Here's another family dynamic that creates some difficulties. Sometimes it's addictions that get in the way. Now, I want to I, I wanna make sure that I'm clear. When I talk about addictions, I'm not just talking about substances. Uh, work can be an addiction as well. And it could be the outlet that you use to avoid what God actually wants you to address. I know what that's like. And so when I talk about addictions that create um, family difficulties or challenges, um, it could be both substance and work. Uh, there is such thing as a workaholic. And again, you're using that as an excuse to not address and allow God to lead you through the challenges that maybe happen at home. 
I know it's quiet in this place. That's how I know God is getting into your Kool-Aid. I blame God because I'm just preaching his word. Um, it goes on. Here's another challenge. How about communication issues? What I, well, here's one specifically without, because I could unpack this for a long time. And this may be for some married couples here in this place. But um, when, I, when, I, when I talk about communication that creates challenges, it's, sometimes it's the lack of. In other words, sometimes it's the silence that leads to more challenges. Uh, Side note really quick. One thing about silence, silence is the breeding ground for assumptions. If you don't talk about it, I'm helping some married folk out in this place. If you don't talk about it, if you stay silent about it, guess what? You're giving each other room to assume what the other person is thinking. That's why I say silence is the breeding ground for assumptions. You're assuming what your spouse may be thinking. You're assuming what uh, they're doing or not doing. Uh, Again, that's why communication is so important. Because the lack of it within a family can create some challenges. Here's two more. Two more dynamics that create some difficulties in families. Um, How about this one? Grief. I still, there's still people to this day. I don't want to dive too much in the past when it comes to 2020. But there's still people to this day who are grieving certain losses. And that grief has gotten in the way of the unity within the family. So sometimes it's grief. Or how about this? What about job loss? That affects families. It affects families a lot. You know, and matter of fact, you know, studies have actually shown that the way somebody grieves a loss of a family, they go through the same grieving process when they lose a job. They grieve that loss. You have this moment where you're like, what am I going to do? Well, guess what? I know what you're going to do. You're going to be part of a spiritual family because this is the family that you need who can partner with you and help you and lead you through every circumstance, every dynamic that I read here. Again, the only reason I read those is because I believe that we can relate to maybe one, two, or however many you can relate to. I want to let you know that these are situations within families that God can heal, that God can restore, that God can lead you through. There's nothing too broken for God to put back together. Uh, People may have given up on you, but I'm here to tell you that God does not give up on you. According to the gospel, I'm reminded that Jesus actually came because of our brokenness and said, hey, I'll lay my life down for every person here on earth. So let's not get let's not get caught up in the dynamics or the challenges of our past or even the challenges of our present because you're here because I believe God can lead you through some of these challenges. But one thing that I found interesting that I actually like is that the Bible actually records a lot of family challenges. If you've read the word, you would know really quick that there are a lot of soap operas in this word. There is a lot of drama that happens in the word of God, you know, or maybe for some of you, it might be novellas. There's a lot of novellas in the word of God. In other words, there's, I love that God led man to record, not just the blessings, but he led man to also record the weaknesses of man, which reminds us of how much we need a heavenly father, a divine father to lead us through the the challenges that we face. Specifically, because again, I can go on and on about all the family challenges in the Bible from Genesis all the way to Revelation. But I just want to point out one because it, it, it really uh, it really shocked me that it didn't take too long in the beginning of the Bible for challenges to take place. Matter of fact, you can go to Genesis three and you can learn about some challenges that happened already between two people called Adam and Eve, you remember Adam and Eve, the first two people, the human beings that God had created. You know, I love it. The Bible starts out great. God creates, God creates the heavens and the earth. You know, God sets up the geography. And the next thing you know, he creates humanity, you know, and then everything seems phenomenal. Then he places man and woman or Adam and Eve. He places them in the garden, which was a pleasurable place. Man, if this were a show, he'd be like, man, this is great. This is awesome. God's power, the setting is beautiful. He creates man. Aren't you thankful that God created you and I? But then something happens in Genesis chapter three. 
what happens in Genesis chapter 3 is we see man make choices that led to challenges. Do you know that the choices you make will sometimes determine whether you stay stuck in a challenge or whether you get through a challenges? That's how powerful choices are. You can choose to stay stuck or you could choose to trust God and choose to allow him to lead your heart and say, I'm not staying stuck in this. I'm going to choose the father's way and allow him to lead me through my circumstance. I'm going to allow him to lead my marriage. I'm going to allow him to lead my heart. I'm going to allow him to lead my life. Choices are so powerful. And we see, again, really quick in the book of Genesis, at the very beginning, we see man make a choice outside of God's, God's boundaries, and it creates more challenges. In Genesis chapter 3, I, I want to share with you, okay? I want to share with you what kind of led to some family feud. Choices that were made that created challenges in the very beginning of the Bible. And I want to show you these because a lot of what God records, he records it in his word. He records it in hopes that we would avoid it by trusting him. And so here's some things that I would encourage you to avoid so that we can continue to walk as a healthy spiritual family. And so you can have a healthy spiritual family in your home. Here's some things to avoid that took place in Genesis chapter three. This is all from Genesis chapter three. I think what's created some challenges, some choices uh, that again, Adam and Eve have made. How about this one? The reason that we have some challenges in our family is because we invite unauthorized voices. Unauthorized voices. Uh, let me read uh, little Genesis chapter three. Uh, you remember that voice that she ended up talking to? Uh, there was this, uh, this thing that was in the garden called a serpent. Uh, don't be shocked if a serpent shows up in a place where God has placed you. Wow. Uh, serpents can be anywhere. Remember, God created the Garden of Eden. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Are you with me? God created the Garden of Eden. And the serpent was also in the Garden of Eden. Yeah. Don't be shocked if there's a serpent in a place where God has positioned you. You got to be careful with the voices that are in your garden. Hello, somebody. Your home, you got to look at your house as your garden. You got to look for those of you that are part of this ministry, that are part of the, the, the team here. Matter of fact, can we just take a moment to give it up for the gospel team? All those who volunteer their, their time. But you can't be shocked even when the serpent's voice tries to show up in church. Right. <laughs> You got to be careful with the unauthorized voices. Who are you listening to? Who are you really listening to? Who or what voice are you authorizing to lead you, to lead your choices? Because, you know, let's be honest. We have a bunch of thoughts, right? Or maybe it's just me. We all have a bunch of thoughts. I mean, there's like thousands of thoughts that go through our mind every day. And you got to be careful, though. You got to be careful that you don't grab a hold of those thoughts because the minute you grab a hold of a thought that may not line up with God's word, if you grab a hold of it, it can grab a hold of you. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And now your heart is being led by a thought, not being led by truth, come on, come on. not being led by God's word. You got to be careful with the unauthorized voices that even show up in your head. You can't let some of those thoughts linger because the longer they linger, the louder they get. And the loudest voice in your life will become the leading voice in your life. And that voice may not be the voice of God. That voice may not be what's in God's word. You got to be careful with that. Unauthorized voices. You know, it's funny. Like, I trip out. Um, you know, I'm in a different location, right? So there's different radio stations. You know, there's stations that you don't like. Or maybe you like every station. There's some radio stations where you're like, eh, next one, right? Or maybe you have a playlist and you're like, ah, next song. Why do we do that? We change the song because we don't like what we're hearing. Wow. Please, come on, come on, come on. You change the station when you don't like what you're hearing. I guess what I'm trying to let you know is you got to change the station sometimes on yourself. In other words, you got to tune into God's station and tune into what God is saying because some of those thoughts don't line up with God's truth. Unauthorized voices. I know I'm parking here for a minute, but I feel, like, I feel like somebody's just being encouraged right now. And God is using me just to remind you that you need to change the station. 
the voice that is leading you is not God's voice. And matter of fact, it's misleading you. It's keeping you stuck. It's keeping you in your situation, which is what the enemy wants to do. He doesn't want to see you healed. He doesn't want to see you at Gospel Church. He doesn't want you serving here, the family at Gospel Church. He doesn't want you to be a part of this family. That's that unauthorized voice that showed up in the garden. Change the station. Tell your neighbor right now, let's change the station. Let's change the station. That music is no good. The enemy station, you know, 92.3 Lucifer line, it just does not work. <laughs> Change the station. Okay, here's the next one. Here's the next thing that created some family challenges. And again, we're sticking with the book of Genesis here. Uh, how about this? Challenges were created because there was crossing boundaries. They crossed boundaries. God created the garden. He placed Adam and Eve in the garden. The garden was designed to be a blessing, right? A fruitful place that they were supposed to steward. But notice this. God didn't just give them the blessing without a boundary. I'll prove it to you. God placed them in the garden in Eden. But then what did he do? After he positioned them, he gave them instructions. And he told them there is a, there's a tree that they can eat from, the tree of life. And there's another tree that they are to avoid. God was creating a boundary. He says, don't cross over to eat from this tree. So he gave them a blessing with a boundary. You're following me. Yeah. But what happened? Well, when you read the story, you understand that Eve crossed the boundary. She ended up eating from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. And what happened? That created a lot of challenges for them. Matter of fact, uh, I love what the Bible says. Um, if you go back to chapter two, it talks about, you know, when Adam and Eve were created. And I know I didn't say this in the last service, but I just... I feel encouraged to share this right now, but when you read it, when God created Adam and Eve, the Bible describes their relationship. And this is probably, again, for, for married folks. Um, but the way that the Bible describes their relationship, it says that they were naked and unafraid. They were naked and unafraid. Meaning, not just physically. Meaning everything was exposed and they were unashamed. You want, to know, you want to know what a healthy marriage looks like? Is when everything is exposed and nobody's walking in shame. Husband and wife should be fully exposed. So not just naked physically per se, but spiritually open with the person that God has brought in your life. But going back to what happened with Eve, when she ate of the fruit, she crossed the boundaries. All of a sudden they realized their nakedness. And something else took place. And then they ended up running away. They ended up hiding from God. I think sometimes that, that could be us. We, we, we make a choice outside of God's instruction. And there's, two, there's one of two responses. You're either going to run and hide. You're either going to run away or you're going to run to God. And we've all made mistakes in this house. So uh, there's crossing boundaries. How about this? Uh, the other thing that created some challenges, again, Genesis 3, is avoided issues. When Eve brought the fruit to Adam, what did he do? He just ate it. I like to say he loved his wife so much that he'll eat anything she cooks. No, I'm just kidding. Uh, that's not the Bible. But, but, but he ate it. He ate it. I almost want to give Adam credit, but we understand, though, that it created some challenges, though. It created some challenges because they ate of something that God told them to avoid. And so what happened, Adam didn't address what she did. Instead of addressing the choice she made, he ended up participating in the same choice and ate from the fruit. Then words, he didn't address it. You got to address it. You know, avoided issues don't solve issues. <laughs> that might sound very practical, but it's something I think we all need to be reminded of. Avoided, issue, avoided issues don't solve issues. We got to address some things. And I'll put it this way too. You... It's hard, to, it's hard to adjust something in your life when the challenges aren't addressed. It's, it's almost like going to the doctor and uh, going to the doctor and say, hey, I have this pain. And the doctor says, where's your pain? And you tell him, I can't tell you that. Wait a minute. So you went to the doctor knowing something's wrong, but you're not telling him where it's wrong. 
So the doctor can't even do his part and help you because you're not willing to address where the pain is. So because you're not telling him where you're hurting, because you're not addressing it, he can't do his part and help you make adjustments that will lead to your healing. You got to address it because we weren't called to walk broken. We were called to rock broken. Um, okay, last two. And then I'm going to encourage you with some, some values of being part of a spiritual family. Because being a part of a spiritual family is the best family in Jesus' name. Here's the last two that create challenges that we're learning from Genesis 3. How about this? Misplaced blame will create some challenges. What, it, what happened, again, uh, when, when God showed up on the scene after Adam and Eve ate of the fruit? God's like, where are you? He told Adam, where are you? And then they get into the conversation and Adam tells God, it's that woman you gave me. <laughs> Husbands, don't do that. Again, I'm reading this for things to, for us to avoid. <laughs> because blame creates more challenges. Blame will always create more challenges. But that's what Adam did. He wanted to blame her. It's funny because if you, if you backtrack just a little bit in Genesis, when God first created Eve and Adam saw her, he actually sang a song. He says, oh, this is bone of my bone and flesh of my flesh. He was singing about what was created, but he went from singing to blaming real quick. It's like some married folk, and I'm a married person. This happens at time. Hey, we love the honeymoon. We're singing at the honeymoon. Hallelujah. Uh-huh. I'll let your mind do the rest, but the honeymoon's great. You're singing, worshiping. Thank God for her. Two years later, it's like, man, this woman right here, I can't believe, Right? So some of us fall into the same trap. Again, misplaced blame will always create family challenges. And then lastly, how about this one? Covering and hiding will also continue to create challenges. God didn't call you to hide. God wants you to, to run to him, not run away. God wants you to be a part of a spiritual family who says, hey, we love you. No matter what your history looks like, we love you. Hey, we've all made choices outside of God's word. We still love you. In other words, uh, your choices in your life are not going to stop me from choosing to love you into who God has called you to be. I'm going to love you through all of this. That's the, type of, that's the type of family the gospel church is. Spiritual family is the best family. Here's three reasons why. Three reasons why you want to be part of a spiritual family. The first reason is this because a spiritual family is a God led family. A spiritual family is a God led family. I love what Jesus said in Matthew chapter 12, Matthew 12, uh, 46 through 50. It says, as Jesus was speaking to the crowd, his mother and brothers stood outside asking to speak to him. Someone told Jesus, your mother and your brother are standing outside and they want to speak to you. Jesus asked, who is my mother? Who are my brothers? Then he pointed to his disciples. He pointed to the people at Gospel Church. And he said, look, these are my mother and brothers. Anyone who does the will of my Father in heaven is my brother and sister and mother. What Jesus was letting you and I know is that spiritual family is anybody that does the will of God. Anybody that says, I want to be God led. I want God to lead me through this circumstance. And I'm here to encourage you to let you know that that's exactly what your pastors are. Pastor Billy, Pastor Randy, the reason that they're even in this place here, the reason that they came from Southern Cali to where they're at is because they were God led already. And look at the fruits of having God led leaders, a God led church wouldn't be here if it wasn't for their yes. You know you're a part of a spiritual family when there's more thy will versus my will. It's not about what Andrew wants to do. Matter of fact, uh, uh, Andrew, Andrew always got Andrew in trouble in the past. I got a BC life. Some of you also do. What does BC mean? Before Christ. I used to live without Jesus for a while, and I realized that Everything that I tried in this world did not give me transformation. The world is really good at giving satisfaction, but Jesus gives us transformation. His love does not leave us the same. And when I turned to him, things started to turn around. You, you got to be careful who you turn to. Got to be careful who you turn to. Who do you turn to when you go through challenges? I want to let you know that you have a spiritual family here. That no matter what mistakes you've made, this is the place that you can come to and experience the transforming love of Jesus 
that does not leave you the same. It's a, it's a God-led family. The second reason why a spiritual family is the best family is because it's a persevering family. It's a persevering family. Proverbs kind of, uh, kind of gives us this. Uh, it says in Proverbs 17, 17 in the Passion Translation, the Bible says, a dear friend will love you no matter what, and a family sticks together through all kinds of trouble. A family sticks together through all kinds of trouble. Somebody say, through it all. Come on, say it like you mean it. Say, through it all. No matter what trouble you experience, again, a spiritual family says, hey, we're going to link arms and we're going to walk through this valley together. You're not in this alone. We're going to be here with you. Matter of fact, I'm going to pray for you. Let's journey together. That's, that's, that's why I know your, your pastors talk about being connected, you know, whether it's with a life group, you know, or even being connected to the team. It's because, again, we want you to link arms to a spiritual family that will persevere with you, that's willing to go through it all with you, to remind you that you're not alone. Acts, Acts chapter 16 kind of like brings this uh, passage in Proverbs. It brings it alive. Acts chapter uh, 16, speaking of family, a spiritual family perseveres together. Um, it says this, it says, uh, 1623, it says, after they were severely beaten, okay, this is Paul and Silas, by the way, the they is Paul and Silas in this story. It says, after they were severely beaten, they were thrown into prison and the jailer was commanded to guard them securely. So the jailer placed them in the innermost cell of the prison and had their feet bound and chained. Paul and Silas, undaunted, prayed in the middle of the night and sang songs of praise to God. I don't know about you, but if I have just been beaten and thrown in jail and it's midnight, the last thing I'm probably doing is praising. Honestly, when I really think about it, I'm kind of challenged by this scripture. And that's what God's word does. It challenges you. Because when I read this, man, it challenged me because I think about how maybe my flesh would respond in this moment. Um, if anything, if somebody woke me up at midnight, I probably would be complaining, not praising. Anybody else can relate to that? But remember, we're talking about a spiritual family perseveres together. They don't let you go through trouble by yourself. There's two men. Paul and Silas are both praising God at the midnight hour. I don't know who initiated the praise, but what I do know is that they didn't let each other praise God alone in the difficult situation. Paul or Silas said, hey, if you're gonna worship, I'm gonna worship with you. I know we've been beaten. I know my situation's difficult. I know we don't know if we're gonna get out of prison, but guess what? We're gonna praise him in our prison because we understand that God is still faithful. Spiritual family is the best family. It's the family, it's a family we all need. It's a persevering family that'll be with you. Perseverance. What does perseverance look like? You ever thought about that? Perseverance. Here's the way I'd like to describe it. Perseverance uh, happens when we decide to allow God's vision to lead us instead of our emotions and our condition. When, when you're led by God's vision, when you're led by God's promises, when you're led by God's word, because let's, let's be honest, we all have emotions and our conditions change. Yep. Emotions come and go and conditions go up and down. But if there's anything that is constant, it's God's love through it all. And so if anything, if I want to be led by, I want to be led by God's love. God's love looks like being led by God's word. You know that God's word is, is actually a love letter to his people. That's how I like to look at it. I don't, I'm not reading a book. I'm not even reading history. I'm reading God's love letter to his people. It's a love letter about redemption. It's a love letter about healing. It's a love letter that doesn't leave me how I am. Yeah. It's persevering. A spiritual family will praise God with you no matter what situation you're in. They're with you through it all. I want to show you a picture, and I want to let you know why I consider your pastor's my spiritual family. They will always be my spiritual family as my brother and my sister. I want to take you back to 12 years ago. This is me. Decided to get baptized. Broken. Had an ugly past. Remember, did, made a lot of decisions outside of, of God's word and God's love. I was so lost. I was turning to the things of this world until I had this moment. But notice this. I'm not in the water alone. I'm not in the water alone. I had a spiritual family 
who said, I'll get in the water with you if you're going to decide to be baptized because this is a huge moment in your life. This is a huge step of faith. And look at that guy. Who's this guy? (laughs) Anybody know that guy? (laughs) Got less facial hair right here. Somebody last service said, that's baby Billy. And now he's big Billy. I don't know. (laughs) But this is what spiritual family does. They're willing to get in the water with you. They're willing to go through the challenges with you. I didn't recognize these last service, but there's some of you here today. and Maybe God's calling you to the water. Maybe that's your next step of faith. Baptisms are happening after this service. Maybe this is your next step. And you have spiritual family here who says, we want to be a part of that next step. We want to join you. We're going to be there to celebrate you. They've brought clothes. Anything you need to get in the water is right here. So you can't let the excuse of, well, I didn't really come dressed to be baptized. It's all good. We expected. Matter of fact, there's so much faith in this place that they prepared for your spontaneous step of faith here. Spiritual family perseveres. As I close, again, why being part of a spiritual family is is the best family and it's the family that we all need. It's because it's also a fathered family. It's a fathered family. Going back to Romans chapter 8, verse 15 through 16, um, I want to read that passage again because it, it supports that point that we're a fathered family. It says, and you did not receive the spirit of religious duty. I love that. That being adopted into God's family, it's not about duty. We make life too much about doing. There's always so much to do, right? There's always something to do. Uh, and it's funny because we call each other human beings but we've become human doings. We forgot about what being looks like. Uh, What do I mean by being? Being with Jesus, being with God, spending time to be, you know, to be loved by him means to be, or to be fathered by him means to be loved by him. Spiritual family is a fathered family. It says, uh, it goes on and says, but you have received the spirit of full acceptance and folding you into the family of God and you will never feel orphaned. You will never feel orphaned for as he rises up within us, our spirits join him in saying the words of tender affection, beloved father for the Holy spirit makes God's fatherhood real to us. As he whispers into our innermost being, you're God's beloved child. When you, when you accept everything God has for you and you decide to join his spiritual family, specifically here at gospel, something supernatural happens. Something supernatural happens when you take a step of faith. I feel like there's some of us here and maybe you've been an orphan too long. And let me, let me, let me break down what I mean by that. You know, uh, uh, having an orphan mindset kind of looks like this. Uh, Somebody who deals with an orphan mindset who's been neglected, and I'm not sure who's dealt with neglect growing up, but maybe there's a mindset that you've adopted that's kept you isolated. Orphans will always feel isolated because they haven't accepted what God has for them. Here's what that looks like. An orphan's mindset, sometimes it's, it's focusing, all you do is focus on faults. It's just always about what's wrong. Maybe, maybe you haven't forgiven you because all you're doing is allowing the enemy to get you to focus on your faults. That's an orphan mindset. Or how about this? There's trust issues. Trust issues is also a part of having an orphan's mindset. It's hard for you to trust anybody. And I get it. Maybe you went through some pain. Maybe somebody close to you hurt you. But I want to let you know that is not what the Father wants to do. What the Father wants to do through Jesus is he wants to heal you. He wants to restore you. He wants to love you. He wants to pick up all those broken pieces and show you that that he can follow you. We're all called to be sons and daughters. But we can only walk as sons and daughters by believing in Jesus and allowing ourselves to be fathered. Some of us in here, you just, I understand you've been through some pain and some people have hurt you. But I want to remind you and let you know what the word says. God, as your heavenly father, if you invite him in, 
He's not here to hurt you. He's here to heal you and help you. Because here's what sons and daughters walk with. Sons and daughters who are part of the spiritual family are secure. They feel accepted. They're significant. They have their identity in God, not their identity in the world. They're generous. They trust. They're humble. Uh, They don't strive for position because they're led by purpose. And they simply love people. Can we all stand in this moment? I believe that there's some of us that are here this morning and your next step of faith is to receive Jesus as your savior and God as your father. By receiving Jesus as your savior, you're also accepting God as your father. By receiving Jesus, you're also receiving the father's love. The Bible says, John 3, 16, that God so loved the world that he sent his one and only begotten son so that if anybody believed in him, they would not perish but experience eternal life. I don't know about you, but I would want to experience that. 